All these are symptoms of imposter syndrome. The feeling of inadequacy a person feels in their own abilities. You feel inadequate, you feel fake or phony doing something, and you, you might be telling yourself things like, oh, this is not for me, this is too hard for me, I can't do it, it's easy for other people, but it's really hard for me, yeah, or I feel weird, I don't feel like myself when I do it. If you think about it, it's actually insecurity. I had a conversation the other day with a friend who's going to return to studying English, and I thought it would be really interesting to ask your two cents to get your opinion on what we were talking about. So he's Brazilian, but he lives in Spain, and he actually speaks native like Spanish. He's actually taken the exam, now I'm forgetting what it's called, but it's from the Cervantes Institute here. So he has a C1, which is almost native like Spanish. And he's wanting to return to studying English. And so I was encouraging him to speak English with me so I could just give him some feedback and maybe some tips and stuff like that. But he, he really didn't want to. He, he felt nervous just thinking about speaking English with me. It was very obvious he's struggling from some, some sort of linguistic inhibition. And despite having, for me, it was shocking because he has this remarkable bilingual aptitude in Spanish. And he's someone to, to me, at least, he seems otherwise very confident. So. For me, it was very surprising that it was something that he was nervous just thinking about. But by pressuring him and, and perhaps with the influence of a couple glasses of wine, I finally got him to open up and speak to me for a couple minutes. And he made mistakes, but his accent was really good. I didn't see him making the typical pronunciation errors that a lot of my Brazilian students and other Brazilians who are at a lower level speaking English tend to make. So for me, he really has no reason to be embarrassed because he sounds great when he speaks. He's, he's slow, he makes mistakes, but he doesn't sound like there's anything that he should be embarrassed about. But obviously he has some sort of psychological block there. And so I asked him after we, we switched back to Spanish because we were with uh, his partner who speaks Spanish, who's, who's from Spain. We, you know, I asked him, why are you so embarrassed? Why is it so nerve wracking for you? when you just think about her when you speak English, because you, you sound great. And basically what we got into is the story that he tells himself is that he was able to achieve his really high level in Spanish because it's similar to Portuguese. But when he's self-doubting, he believes that he won't be able to reach that level in English because it's, it's not as similar to his native language. Even though he worked really hard to get to where he is in Spanish, it's not like something that just came to him without hard work and effort. I identified at least part of what he's experiencing as imposter syndrome. That's like part of what I wanted to discuss today. Uh, and we continued to, uh, chatting with him and his Spanish partner. And his Spanish partner has uh, like C2 level, which is the very highest level that you can get. He's lived in, in several different countries. So we got to talking about this and it was really interesting because we discussed how many English learners struggle with these cognitive barriers with English that they probably wouldn't suffer from if they were studying any, uh, any other language, any other language that's not a lingua franca, like, like English. Because there's a whole, there's all this baggage that comes along with English. There's this societal perception that people have in non-English speaking countries of people who have gotten to advanced level speaking English. In other words, people have achieved like that high level of English fluency have something that learners who don't have that yet convince themselves that they can't be successful without. And that could be things like um, money, time, or opportunities to, to study or live abroad or take the best courses and so on. Um, success, maybe status, all these sort of things. So it's true in both Brazil and Spain, as we were talking about in, in our conversation. In most countries that I have lived in, I've observed some version of this. So thanks for allowing me my soapbox there. I want to ask you, what, what do you think about this? Is this something that you have observed there in Brazil, that you've observed in your own learning, that you've observed with your students? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, you, what you're saying about imposter syndrome is very true. If you think about it, it's actually insecurity, right? Let's say that imposter syndrome is a fancy term for insecurity. There is insecurity there in your skills, in your abilities to perform a task successfully. I think that that is very common. And there are reasons for that. Uh, one reason could be cultural. 
it reminds me of this term that we have here in Brazil called the, um, I'm going to say it in Portuguese, the complexo de viralatas, or complexo mm -hmm. de viralata, syndrome do viralata, you know? Uh, translating that to English is like stray dog syndrome. Yeah, that's how mm -hmm. I would translate What is it. a stray dog, in case people aren't familiar with that? It's a street dog that doesn't have an owner, and usually it's a dog that, uh, that is kind of mixed breed. And historically speaking, stray dogs uh, were not the favorite types of dogs by people. Maybe nowadays people are getting more, let's say, affectionate uh, about stray dogs. But historically speaking, uh, stray dogs, they were not seen as with positive eyes, let's say. So that's where this term here in Brazil, complexo de viralata, or stray dog syndrome, comes from. I think a Brazilian writer coined that term in the 50s. First, he was talking about soccer, football. But actually, uh, this translates to other areas. And I, I, I feel that there is that in my country, for example, a little bit. You know, this feeling of inferiority. We believe that things that come from first world countries or more developed countries are better. And we also feel like we are not enough. We are not good enough. Or we can't perform as well as maybe somebody from one of those countries, you know. Um, I am very hopeful that this has been changing now, <laughs> but uh, it could be a factor. Yeah. So why are we talking about this? Because one way to maybe fix that insecurity that you have, I would say, is uh, reflect, make this reflection and analyze maybe where this insecurity is coming from. Might mm. come from your culture, maybe, you know, uh, the way you were brought up by your family, by your uh, immediate peers. Or something more generalized, like I just described, this syndrome here in Brazil that we have. As you were sharing the story about your friend, you said that uh, he was finally able to open up to you at some point. What does it mean when a person mm -hmm. opens up to somebody else? Right. It means that you, generally, you make yourself vulnerable in a situation. So we might also call this, in some, some cases, we might call this, for example, a heart to heart. That's when you have a deep conversation with someone about something that you're struggling with emotionally, uh, an experience that you had that maybe was traumatic or doesn't even need to be the level of trauma, but it, that was difficult for you or something like this. So this wasn't exactly a case of being a heart to heart, but he opened up in the sense that it was something that was really difficult for him. And he put himself outside of his comfort zone to try that experience, to try speaking uh, English for just a minute with me, you know? You used a really cool term here. You said nerve wracking. When something is nerve wracking, mm. what's that? <laughs> That's how I would feel about going onto a stage and speaking to a huge audience. I can do it in podcasts, I can do it in video form, but if I was actually in front of a live audience that I can see and I can see them staring at me, that would be a nerve wracking experience. It's something that makes you feel anxious, makes you feel panicky, like you want to escape from that situation. Makes you on edge, right? On edge, that's another nice way to say it, yeah. And you also said self-doubting. Yeah, if you doubt, it's that you're not certain about something. So if you self-doubt, it means that you're not certain about yourself or your abilities. So mm. if you self-doubt your English in this case, it means that you're not sure whether the other person will understand you, whether you'll have the vocabulary necessary, whether you will make lots of mistakes, which you definitely will, and, and so on. Would it be similar to second guessing as well, would you say? That's a even better way to say it. I'd say second yeah. guess yourself. Yeah. All these are symptoms of imposter syndrome or insecurity. Nice. And you you mentioned lingua franca. English is a lingua franca nowadays. I think it's nice to define mm -hmm. that. Uh, what do we mean when we say that English is a lingua franca? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, lingua franca comes from Latin and it literally means a French language because French used to be the lingua franca. And the lingua franca is the language that people use to communicate with each other. So actually, in that situation, our lingua franca was Spanish. But in general, when people talk about lingua franca nowadays, they're referring to English because in, I don't know what percentage, I'm throwing this, pulling this out of a hat here, but 90%, let's say, of situations where it's two people from different countries communicating, that communication will be in English. I think I'm done, yeah. There, there is more vocab to be defined, <laughs> but... Let's keep going. And people should use the app. If you missed anything on the app, oh, yeah. you get all of the most difficult vocabulary defined for you. With flashcards, right? With flashcards too, so you never forget them. So you can find that linked in the description or by searching for Real Life English in the Apple app 
or Google Play Store. And one thing I wanted to comment on here that in my research for pre preparing for having this discussion with you, besides imposter syndrome, something that I stumbled onto was called achievement paradox. Now, achievement paradox is something that learners perceive that achieving fluency in English requires more than it actually does. So the reason I bring this up is that it is a lot of work to get to an advanced level in English. Of course, I'm not saying that it is not. I'm not trying to sell you any magical pill that's going to make you a C1 or C2 level English speaker. But I bring this up because I believe that for most of us, when we see someone who is excellent at anything, so I'm learning rock climbing now. I see someone who's, you know, just killing it. They're, they're flying up the rocks. It's very easy to think that that person has always had that, or they have some sort of special talent. They have some sort of special skill. They have something that I don't have. It's very easy for those thoughts to creep in. And we have to, we talked about this actually in our last podcast, all about self-talk. We really have to be aware of our self-talk that we have. So when it comes to observing someone who is a successful English learner, it's very easy to think these things, that that person has something, some advantage that I don't have. And so I won't be able to get to the level that they are at. And that's not the case because you didn't see their whole process in learning the language. You haven't seen all of the long nights, long hours of studying. You haven't seen all of the mistakes that they made. You haven't seen the first conversations that they had where they felt panicky on edge, like we were saying. They've been through all those things already. And they got to where they are because they embraced that experience. They were willing to stretch themselves outside of their comfort zone and go through, especially dedicate the time and go through the hard effort to get to that place. So this is the case of anyone that you see that is an expert in what they do, is that they spent a lot of time, they made a lot of mistakes, they put in a lot of effort. You can get there too. Tiago worked his ass off to get to where he is today with his English. You can get there too, but you have to be willing to make all those mistakes, do all that hard work, and seem seem like a, a silly or uh, incompetent or childish <laughs> English speaker, right? At some point. You know, you were talking about success, right? Uh, we tend to only look at the success the person has achieved, and we tend to uh, forget that behind that success, there's a lot of many years of hard work and dedication and maybe sleepless nights, right, involved. Mm -hmm. And also I want to point out here that about imposter syndrome, everybody feels it. So it's important to mention that it's okay to feel insecure from time to time in your own abilities uh, ab mm -hmm. about something, you know? I, I, and I see that also in su successful people as well. Successful people also feel that from time to time. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that it's something that I recognize in all the artists I've worked with. It's about that feeling of always feeling you're in process and that you could be better. I mean, every movie I've ever done is like, I, I, am I going to be able to do this? Uh, you know, I, like many others, walked into that school with a stigma in my own head. Uh, more young people nowadays call it imposter uh, syndrome. So you might feel it when you are a beginner, for example, or when you are in the process of learning something new, because this is you getting out of a comfort zone. That is true. But also, I have seen very successful people who, has, who have achieved wonderful things in life, but they still, from time to time, they might feel insecure in their own abilities, or they might feel fake, like, uh, how, why am I here? I mean, I shouldn't be here. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I feel insecure with my English sometimes as well, depending on the day I'm having, or depending on uh, uh, if I slept well the night before, or for whatever reason, right? But it's important that mm -hmm. you are okay with this, but also it's important that you... Um, work on building up your confidence, yeah, more and more. And there are, there are ways for you to do that. One of the videos I saw even said that imposter syndrome isn't a great name for this because it sounds like something that is a sickness or something that only some people yeah. catch or suffer from. And that's not the case. All of us at some point with something that we're learning or some experience that we're having will feel imposter syndrome. So they also called this imposterism. I think that's mm -hmm. even a nicer term for it is imposterism because Everyone at one time or another is going to feel imposterism. Even people who get to the level of mastery, of supposed mastery, will often feel that sort of anxiety that mm -hmm. I'm a fake, I'm a fraud, right? Some, yeah. Someone's going to catch me at some point and, and realize that I'm just, I'm just making it up as I go. I got to share a story about that because I think we've been talking about music a lot recently. 
And uh, I've already mm -hmm. mentioned Metallica here, one of my favorite bands. And they came to Brazil in 2022 for a series of concerts. And they passed through my city here, Curitiba, and then they went to Sao Paulo. And then their last concert was in Belo Horizonte, I believe, in 2022. And then in that last show, something really interesting happened. The lead singer, James, he, at some point of the show, he stopped uh, before playing a, a, another song. And they, he just opened up to the audience. He said, hey guys, to be honest with you, I wasn't feeling so good today uh, before coming up on stage. I was feeling a little bit insecure. Like, oh, I'm an old guy now. I can't play as accurately or as fast as I used to. I gotta tell you, I wasn't feeling very good before I came out here. Feeling a little bit insecure. Like, I'm an old guy. I can't play anymore. All this bullshit. You know those, mm -hmm. that BS, he says, yeah, that we always tell ourselves. And then he says, mm -hmm. but these guys here, and then he pointed at the, the band members, right? That were with him on stage. These guys told me, hey, if you are struggling on stage, we got your back, right? And then it was a beautiful scene because you know, he was open and vulnerable at that moment to a whole stadium of fans about how he was feeling secure that night. And then after he said that, the other members of the band uh, came up to him and hugged him. <laughs> but you see, he is a successful guy in his craft. Metallica is maybe one of the, the best bands of all time, right? And he still feels this insecurity from time to time. And the cool thing is that he was open and vulnerable enough to share that, yeah? And he had the support of the fans and also the band members. So I would say one way maybe for you to fix this insecurity or this imposterism, as you said, Ethan, is by talking to people you trust about it. Maybe you find a good friend that you trust or maybe uh, your spouse or maybe somebody else and just openly talk about it when you feel insecure or when you feel not at your best. Talking about it can be healing as well. And it can give you strength to keep going. Opening up to someone, as we were saying earlier. So I, I wanted to comment on that, but I wanted to first take advantage because there were some interesting expressions you used. You said BS. What does it mean? I'm going to say the word bullshit. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. short for bullshit. Yeah, so uh, all those bullshit things that we tell ourselves, oh, you know, I, I can't do this as well as I did, or I'm a phony, I'm a fake. Yeah, this is all BS. It's not true. You can also tell someone that if you don't believe something they're saying, it's like bullshit. Come what on, do you that's mean? BS. That's yeah. not true. <laughs> exactly. And one other expression you said, got your back or got your back. There's connected speech there, right? Got your, got your back. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? When a, when a friend, for example, tells you, hey, man, I got your back. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. I'm here for you to help you if, you if you need, to give you support if you need. You're not alone. So you, you, it's a reassurance, a kind of a reassurance, right? It's a way to reassure the person that, hey, I got your back. You're not alone. I'm here with you. Yeah. So what I wanted to bring up, uh, something else that came up when I was researching for this conversation was a term called pluralistic ignorance. I thought this was really nice. Wow. It's when... We feel like we're the only person having experience, even though other people also are having that experience because no one's actually saying so. No one's being vulnerable and voicing, hey, I'm, I'm experiencing this. Hey, I'm feeling this and so on. Just like you mentioned from Metallica, he wasn't, maybe at first he was suffering from this, but then he opened up, right? To, to share that panic, to share that fear, to share those feelings. So all of us probably can, for me, the first thing I think about is when I was a teenager because Every experience you have when you're a teenager, you think it's it's just me. There's something wrong with me, and no, this isn't happening to anyone else. And so I just need to to shut up about it and 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 fake, right? Fake like this isn't happening to me. When exactly what you need in that situation is to open up to someone, say, "Hey, I'm having this problem. Hey, I'm suffering from this," to share those those doubts that you're having, because it combats that. It's like a cure or a medicine for imposter syndrome. Is actually talking about it. So the thing that we really don't want to do in those moments of being vulnerable and sharing that we're suffering from these negative emotions or this panic or whatever it is in your case. And that's exactly what you need in that moment is to tell someone about it. And especially, I was going to say, it's really important to have your tribe. This is why it can be really important to find a community. If you find a community of people who are learning English, for example, like we have uh, the Fluency Circle, which is our community of English learners that are using our courses. And a lot of people, this is really helpful because you're, you have this group of people who are going through the same experience. You're in the same boat, right? This is also why I used to like to go to 
language exchanges or do a tandem, which is uh, when you know one and one with someone you're you're doing, for example, thirty minutes. If uh, I want to learn Portuguese, for example, then we could speak in Portuguese for thirty minutes with Thiago, and then we could speak in English for thirty minutes. So Thiago would correct me for thirty minutes, and then I correct him for thirty minutes. And I'm saying that this is helpful because you're in the same boat as that other person or as that group of people. You're all experiencing the difficulty of speaking another language. There's a lot of shared emotion, shared experience, and you can open up about some of these things, some of these doubts that you're having, right? Just backtracking a little bit, Ethan, I wanted to ask about two pieces of vocabulary here. You said that you stumbled, stumbled on some research, some information. You stumbled mm -hmm. on some information on your research. What does that mean when you stumble on something? It means you find something by coincidence, so without mm. intending to. Nice. Another phrasal verb you used, which is nice, is creep in or creeping in. I think we brought that up in the last podcast, but to creep in is to quietly enter some place without someone knowing. And here I used it figuratively. It's like it enters into your subconscious without you even being really aware of it. So mm. it's something that you really have to look out for because you start feeling all these negative emotions and you don't even realize why that's happening because it just has creeped into your, into your brain. And I wanted to ask Thiago, because we, we brought up this... Well, I was chatting before, right, about the pluralistic ignorance and, and so on. And I was wondering if when you were learning, was there anyone you had who was that trustworthy partner or that mentor that you looked to who you felt like you could open up to? That is a good question. I think I, get, I got that more when I started teaching, actually. Once I started teaching at 21, I think my fellow teachers back then, they were those uh, supportive figures, I would say because they were more experienced than me. I was just a young teacher starting out and I hadn't been speaking English for a long time then, but they had been at it for, for years already. So they helped me in so many ways. Yeah, in so many mm -hmm. ways. Uh, whether it was giving a tip, a language tip, maybe a pronunciation tip, or uh, teaching me a new word, or teaching me how to teach uh, something specific to a class. So I think I got that more once I started working, actually. A teacher can be really great, too, if you aren't in that situation, if you're not actually going to teach yourself. Mm -hmm. Actually paying someone who is your teacher, I think especially a private teacher who is there to, gives you a sense of security, right? Like you're mm -hmm. paying them. They have to put up with all these things that you're having self-doubts about, all these yeah. things that you're scared about making mistakes, yeah. the not having a native-like accent, if that's, that's one of your triggers and so on mm. and so gives you uh gives you a layer of security there for some of this imposter syndrome and i think it's one of those things that for many people will go away with experience so the more that you speak it's going to start actually reinforcing your identity as someone who can speak english so then you will not feel like an imposter you won't feel like you're faking it you might still like even when you get to advanced levels once now and, and again you might have this feeling like i'm an imposter I'm a fraud, I'm faking it, but just knowing that that's a regular, uh, something that happens to everyone, but with practice, you'll feel this less and less often. This is actually my favorite way, I would say, to build up your confidence in something by actually doing the thing you are insecure about, doing it more often. The more you do it, like you said, with practice and time, the more you build up your confidence and the more these negative feelings uh, go away. You might still experience them from time to time, but they are not as frequent. Yeah. Um, I was listening to this podcast the other day and uh, the speaker was talking about uh, the importance of finding evidence to build up your confidence. For example, I don't feel confident as an English speaker. I don't feel confident in my speaking in English. So I need to find evidence for myself that I can speak English that I can be confident, that I can have a conversation with people. And how do I do it? By actually speaking <laughs> <laughs> with as many I people as I can, uh, or even with myself. We have the app, which is a great resource for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, talking for four or eight minutes there with people. Why? Because the more you do it, the more you willingly put yourself in these uncomfortable situations, the more that will serve as evidence to you that, hey, I'm doing it, you know? I'm speaking, I'm con communicating with people, so I can do it. And then if you keep doing that often and for enough time, 
it will come a time when you don't even realize it, but you, kind of, you will kind of look back and say, oh, I'm doing it now. You know, I am speaking English confidently. I am uh, connecting with other people and communicating. Focus on getting the work done, getting out of your comfort zone, and try always to improve one little thing every time you engage in that activity. There was one thing I wanted to circle back to. I believe you mentioned this earlier, but the whole thing about the identity. So I, I had a story that when I was living in Brazil, the first time I was living in Belo Horizonte, that I met a Spanish couple. I became friends with a Spanish couple. And the the woman of this couple, she spoke English. Sorry, not English, Portuguese. She spoke Portuguese. She didn't have a high level in the language, but she was confident and she really embraced the accent. And so she sounded great when she spoke. Now, her husband, on the other hand, I wouldn't even say he had a little bit higher level than her if you were to, to test their level. But he he didn't try at all, at all, to actually have a Brazilian accent. He sounded exactly the same when he spoke Spanish and Portuguese. And I, I actually brought this up one time when we were having dinner. Why why don't you try it? It's, it's, it's fun. You can play with it. I think the accent, especially in Minas Gerais, it's, it's very pronounced, right? So it's, it's something that you can grasp onto and imitate pretty well. And he said that he, he didn't want to because he just didn't feel comfortable when he tried to speak like that. So he, he didn't want to make the efforts to try to imitate and, and have that native accent, which, you know, there, there's arguments, especially for English learners. I'm not saying like you have to speak like a native, of course. Mm -hmm. But in this case, that he wasn't even willing to try. He wasn't even willing to embrace that silliness. So I was curious if you had this experience when you were learning English, Thiago, did you feel like that imposter syndrome of, of the awkwardness of speaking in, a, in another, well, especially with another accent in another language? At first, yes, I felt that because I tried to emulate as close as possible what I would listen to in the movies and series I watched and the music I listened to. So I would try to emulate, to imitate exactly as I heard it the sound, the mm -hmm. articulation, the, the tone of voice. But many times I would feel fake doing it. Like, man, I mean, I don't speak like this in Portuguese. <laughs> Why do I have to do this in English? A great example is the TH. Yeah, the th and the th, right? At first, it was like, we don't have this sound in Portuguese unless you have a lisp. If you suffer from, li from a lisp, okay. But normally we don't have that in the language, right? Mm -hmm. I, I feel silly doing this. I feel weird. But I kept doing it. And then that's the point. If you keep doing it, if you keep, uh, let's say, tapping into that uncomfort feeling enough, after a while, it will become natural for you. It's never natural when you start. But if, mm -hmm. if you keep doing it intentionally, it becomes natural. I was going to say, I've learned several languages outside of English. I haven't, I'd say I haven't learned any to the same level that your English is, of course. But doing this, at some point, I realized that with every language that I learned to, to speak fluently, my identity was different when I spoke that language. It was a little bit different. At the, there's a base of who I am, Ethan, uh, you know, my, my, my core and everything. But there was a layer on top of that that would change with every language that I learned. The Spanish speaking, Catalan speaking, Portuguese speaking, uh, German speaking versions of me were all, are, are all, were all a little bit different. And this is something that a lot of people have a lot of trouble accepting. So yeah, this is something I think that's really interesting to reflect on is who are you when you speak English? I love that because uh, some people find it limiting. Yeah? Like you said, oh, I have to, in order for me to speak, to improve my pronunciation in English, I have to sacrifice my, let's say, I don't know, my country of origin. No, you don't. Uh, I find that it's expensive, right? The more languages mm -hmm. you learn, the more personas and identities you form. On top of that, yes, you still have your core identity, where you come from and everything, but think about it as you are expanding your identity. You are not limiting it, or you're not mm. sacrificing anything, and you are developing personas. Uh, I, I don't speak a third language, so I can't attest to that, but if I were Yet. to <laughs> learn, yeah, right? Yeah. If I were to <laughs> learn a third language, like Italiano, for example, yes, like Italian, I would probably develop another persona in Italian, just like I have a persona in English, a persona in Portuguese, probably my Italian persona would be a little bit different also, yeah? And I think that's the beautiful thing about that. 
an underlying theme in everything we're talking about here, I believe, is stretching yourself, embracing the silliness, embracing that childlike feeling that you have when you're speaking another language that you haven't had the years and years of exposure to that you do in your native language, expressing that natural discomfort that you have because you can't express yourself as you would in your native tongue. And the question that I had for you, Tiago, is anyone who watches often, they know that you don't mind coming across as a little bit silly. You don't mind making voices or uh, there's even one one of our podcasts that we did, uh, you know, a couple months ago where you were uh, imitating a, a witch or something like that. <laughs> that was just like, man. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And and even on our team, the reason you're Axel Pose is because you 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 become this other person when you're when you're singing. You can sing Guns and Roses, and you sound a lot like like Axel Rose, who's the the lead singer. So I want to ask if you have any tips for how learners can do more to embrace that silliness and, and feel more comfortable when they are speaking English. What you said earlier in the episode can come in handy here. The idea that we all go through it. We all feel those things. You know, we all feel insecure from time to time. Uh, we all uh, doubt ourselves or second guess ourselves from time to time. Even the most successful among us or the beginners, we all feel that. So maybe having that in mind that you are not alone in feeling that. Maybe that gives you some comfort to try different things and be a little bit silly because we are all humans, right? We are all people and we all have those insecurities. You probably don't sound as ridiculous as you think you do. Exactly. Either. And that's the point. <laughs> I mean, in our heads, we might think like, oh, I'm going to sound ridiculous if I do this, for example. And I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe I am, but maybe it doesn't sound as bad or as ridiculous <laughs> as maybe you think in our head, right? And people enjoy it, you mm -hmm. know? You come across as more authentic as well, you know? Uh, because you show off your personality. So I think you only get to gain when you are vulnerable and when you are open uh, to show uh, maybe something you are struggling with or, you know, to be silly, yeah, to be playful, yeah? People tend to mm -hmm. like you more when you do that, actually. Start saying it all as a journey, that you're, you're, you're at the beginning of a journey. You're going to get to where you want to be. You're going to get to be that person who's successful, that the person that other people are looking to saying, man, I wish I could speak English like he does. But you have to know that you're at the beginning of that journey. Other people, they're, they're ahead of you. Think of it literally like a path, like other people are just further down that path than you. And mm -hmm. you're going to have to show up every day. You're going to have to put in the hard work, of course, but you're here and you, you want to, if people are watching the video, I'm actually showing you, like you're here, you want to go there. So just one step at a time and you'll make it. And like we were saying, if you're having the imposter syndrome about speaking, you at some point you gotta you gotta get out there. You gotta start speaking, right? It's a good metaphor might be, for example, that I'm sure most people have had the experience at some point of being about to jump into water that you know is cold. You know it's going to be mm -hmm. an unpleasant experience those first seconds when you get in. But then, depending on how cold it is, most of us won't jump into freezing water. But to, uh, usually you're there for a minute or two, and you get used to it right? It becomes more comfortable. So the same thing that you just need to jump into the, the, the pool knowing it's going to be cold. You need to jump into that experience having conversation, knowing that you're going to feel mixed, eno mixed emotions, feel nervous. Your palms are going to sweat maybe. You're, without a doubt, you're going to make lots and lots of mistakes, but the only way you can correct those mistakes is by making them. So you're going to get used to it. Just like a cold pool, eventually it doesn't feel so cold anymore. So We've already been talking about this. Tiago talked about the app. It's a really great way for you to practice your speaking. It's the only place where anytime, anywhere, you can just press a button, connect to another learner for a four to eight minute conversation. The great thing about this too, we were talking about how it's really useful to talk to people who are in the same boat as you, meaning that they are going through that same experience. So you're connecting, most of the people on the app are English learners just like you are. So that means that they are going through the same process. You don't need to be so worried about seeming like an imposter. It's something you could even talk to them about. How long have you been using the app? When did you start feeling comfortable? And so on. And probably a lot of people are going to tell you, no, I'm still nervous before every conversation, but then it, it gets better. And of course, we've been using a lot of very advanced vocabulary and we haven't been defining all of it. So you can, you can listen to the podcast there with a full transcript and get all of the most important vocabulary and expression definitions with vocabulary flashcards so you never forget them. So all that said, we want to not neglect to give a shout out to one of our very special app users. This one goes to Sign Tar Hia. This is an amazing app for me 
This app helps me to speak confidently with other people in the English language. Now I think I'm improving my speaking skills. So guys, you should use this app. Oh uh, yeah, thanks so much for taking the time to leave us that five-star review in the App Store. If you want us to shout you out, you can also do that. And without a doubt, don't wait any longer. Take the plunge into the cold pool by downloading the app and having a conversation today. I gotta ask that, Ethan. What does it mean to take the plunge? <laughs> to take a plunge is to dive into a mm. body of water. There you go. All right, the question here comes from Fabiano. Fabiano says, I am an upper intermediate level English student, and honestly, there are moments when I feel exhausted. But when I come here and watch you guys, all my knowledge becomes useful. And it makes me happy and proud of how much I've been learning these months. Unfortunately, I don't know how to learn anymore, but I'm working on it. Uh, Ethan, what I find interesting about his comment is this last part, actually. First of all, Fabiano, thank you for the wonderful message. We are glad to see that you have been getting value out of these podcast episodes. But he says here, Ethan, I don't know how to learn anymore or more because he's an upper intermediate level English student. He might be feeling that plateau effect, right? Yeah. In other words, the question that I hear from a lot of students is, I feel stuck. What should I do? Mm. Right? That might be another way of putting it. And this happens to all of us. It's what you were saying, the intermediate plateau, right? So that at some point, especially when you're a beginner, the, the learning comes so fast. But at some point, if you're just doing the same things, it's not going to work anymore. You're going to just realize that you're learning really slow or you're not learning hardly at all. And so a lot of learners are like, what happened? I was learning so fast and now I'm just, I'm stuck. I'm not making progress. And I think what you need to do at that point is to, start doing new things, start trying things that you haven't done yet. Especially, I would say that if you feel uncomfortable, then that probably means that you're on the right track. If you try something new and you're like, oh man, like this is so awkward or I just feel completely out of my comfort zone, that probably means like, okay, this is the thing that you need to be doing because it's making you stretch past your point of comfort. I like that. It's a good way to gauge that. Yeah? Am I uncomfortable doing this? So I should keep doing more of that. Because growth and development happens when you get out of a comfort zone, right? Um, I would recommend to Fabiano, uh, like you said, Ethan, just uh, complimenting the same thing. Uh, challenge yourself more. So if you feel stuck in that intermediate level or like there's nothing else to learn, you feel like that. So maybe analyze what kind of material you have been using lately. For example, maybe when you watch a movie or a TV show, uh, you understand everything or pretty much everything and it's kind of easy for you, it's become comfortable, I don't know, start watching TED Talks or lectures, academic lectures on a subject you are interested in. So deliberately look for more challenging material, videos, podcasts that have richer vocabulary. That's a great way to challenge yourself and get out of that comfort zone. Or even though that's happening to you and series or movies really are your bread and butter, then you might want to try to choose ones that are on topics that are probably going to present a vocabulary set that will be new for you. Try, try watching Peaky Blinders and then, you know, we'll come back to talking if you're still feeling like you're, it's too easy for you. There you go. Uh, one question there, Ethan, uh, if movies and series are your bread and butter, you said, what does that mean? Yeah, like it's your thing. It's, it's the thing that you do, the thing that you love. So thanks again so much, Fabiano, for taking the time to leave us that comment and that doubt. It's really a pleasure to be able to help you guys to solve your burning questions, your biggest doubts in learning the language. And if you have a burning question for us, you can leave it down in the comments if you're watching on YouTube, or if you are just listening, you will find our email in the show notes, as long, along with a link to SpeakPipe, which is a place where you can actually leave us an audio message, and we'll even play it here on the podcast if you prefer that. So we look forward to getting your questions and answering them here on the show. All right, so we wanted to just wrap up today's episode by doing a quick recap of some of the key takeaways, things that we hope that you will remember from today's episode that you will go out and try to apply to your own learning in your life. So the first thing that kind of stuck out to me is we came a lot to this theme of having someone that you can open up to, someone that you can confide in and share if you're feeling imposter syndrome, actually make the efforts to share how you're feeling with someone that you trust, or even 
try to find some sort of community of English learners. If it's with English or you know, community of anything else that you're struggling with imposter syndrome with. So you can have that feeling of being in the same boat together. Uh, on top of that, I would also recommend do the work. Do more of the thing that makes you feel uncomfortable or insecure. Because the more you do it, the more you will grow, evolve, develop. And you will come to a point when you, re you will realize that you are actually doing that without any problem at all. So if speaking is your thing, speak more. If you feel like you need to improve vocab to do it, Focus on that. If your listening skills are poor and you don't feel confident in them, practice listening more deliberately. Do the work and trust that with time, those negative feelings tend to decrease. Yeah, it's that whole thing that Amy Cuddy says about fake it till you make it or even fake it until you become it. So embrace those feelings. It's okay to feel like uh, someone who's faking it, like an imposter, like a fraud, uh, and Embrace even that those feelings of silliness, that childlikeness that comes with learning a new language. The more that you do that, the more normalized it will become for you. I can definitely say that after having learned several languages myself, it's just something that's part of the ride, part of the journey. So, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy it while it lasts because someday you're going to be that advanced speaker that people are saying like, man, I wish I could speak English like they do. And, you know, that fun part of the, of the language learning journey, it'll just be a fond memory. Beautifully said. Wonderful way to close today's episode. <laughs> All right. So thanks so much for joining us today. Remember that if you are enjoying these lessons and you want to support us, a free way that you can do that is by leaving us a five-star review in the Apple App Store or Spotify or anywhere else that you listen to this. And of course, if you're on YouTube, you can support us for free by subscribing, hitting the bell so you don't miss a single new lesson and liking this episode. And that way, you know, it will get out to more learners and more people can have fun, take their English to the next level with us. And finally, remember that no matter what divides us, be that imposter syndrome, <laughs> without which unites us is far greater, which I think definitely is imposter syndrome. All of us experience it. So we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Real Life English Podcast. One, two, three. Aww, uh, yeah. yeah. Probably if I only had one choice, of something to use for learning languages as far as a, a piece of media, I would probably have to settle for music. More than series, more than movies, more than books or anything else. For me, it's my my favorite tool. Let's like dig a little bit deeper into this. Why is it that we recommend that? And what are the advantages to learning English or any other language with music?